Hey there, good morning, my name is Andy. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, today in this service, I'll actually be bringing the message here in just a little bit. It's the second week in our series called What's Your Story, in which we're looking at the, our, our story and how our story and God's story intersects. At least that's what we're talking about today. And um, we're gonna be looking at the story of Saul and Ananias here in just a little bit, all right? If you're new to Crossroads, please let us know you're there. Text the word welcome to us, the number you see on your screen. Uh, that is a text only line. You can actually text questions, comments, prayer requests to that line. In fact, if you have a prayer request, there's a couple things you can do. You can text the word now to us at that number and a care team member will contact you. That does take a little bit. Please understand it's not instantaneous. Uh, or you can just text your prayer request directly to us. And we will add that to our prayer list for this week and, and our care team and our elders will pray for you, pray with you over that request that you submit in that way. All right. It's, like I said, great to be here with you. Uh, I'm going to check out just a little bit early so that I can get downstairs, get in place. All right. We've got an exciting service planned. We're starting off with baby dedications. So we'll see Alexa and one of our young families here in just a moment, I believe. I don't see them on stage yet. Oh, there they are. So uh, we'll get rolling here in just a minute. Thanks again. God bless you. See you in a little bit. Good morning, Crossroads. Welcome to church this morning. My name is Alexa Rollman, and I am the kids director here at Crossroads. And this morning is a really special morning for several families here in our church family. It is Dedication Sunday. And so across both services this morning, we are dedicating 18 children to the Lord. So if you can, yeah, give a round of applause for that. I think that's super great. First service, the stage was filled. We had 15 families, I think, yep, during first service. And um, we have another one here. So this morning, again, we are celebrating a commitment that these parents are making to raise their kids to know who Jesus is. And so, we have met with all of these families. We um, have talked with them and they are ready to make this commitment. And so they are gonna do that today in front of you, their church family. Um, they know that we believe that their own children are the most important disciples that they will ever make. They know that we believe that God has uniquely created each and every one of them. And they are excited to make this commitment in front of you this morning. So what I'm gonna have them do is introduce themselves and who they're dedicated and then I have a couple of questions to ask them and to ask you. So um, who do we have here this morning that we're dedicating? Okay, I'm Carla Vaquerizo. Emilio Gonzalez. And here's Samuel Enrique Gonzalez Vaquerizo. <laughs> All right, so I have a couple of questions I'm going to ask you, and your response, I'm going to give you the answer, is we will, okay? So the first question I'm going to ask is, will you commit yourself and Samuel to the Lordship of Jesus? And then my second question is, will you publicly make that commitment known to God and to your church family today? All right, church family, now it's your turn. We're gonna celebrate this with them, but I need you first to go ahead and stand on up. And I have a question for you. Will you commit to doing whatever it takes to come alongside and help these parents live up to the commitment that they are making today? Very good. If you wouldn't mind, go ahead and extend your hand to this family and we're gonna pray over them. God, thank you so much for this family right here and all of the families this morning who have chosen to make this commitment to dedicating their kids to you, God. We just pray a special blessing over each and every one of them that you would provide for them, that you would give them what they need in order to point their kids to you, God. We just thank you so much for each and every one of them and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 
Well, thank you so much, church family. Let's give them a round of applause as they exit the stage. I'm gonna ask you to remain standing and we are going to worship together. Morning, we're gonna be singing a new song this morning. It's called Firm Foundation. It's one of my favorites, but it's about just standing firm on the foundation of Jesus. In this world where it's so easy to look to the left and the right and get distracted by all of these things that are causing us trouble, we get to stand firm on Christ.
him. Let's continue to sing this morning about our loving God. Greater is the one within us. Greater is the one who calls our name. He will never fail. Stronger is the one within. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone this solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace 
When fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ, I'll stand. Good morning, everyone. Oh, you can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Oh, my name is Ken Arnholtz. I'm one of the elders here at Crossroads, and this is my wife, Teresa, who is involved in a leadership role in the women's ministry. 
We're reading um, the text for today's message. It's in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 19. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Hello, thanks. Yeah, it's good to worship and together like that. And it's also good to celebrate the reading of God's word together. So thank you very much for applauding for the Aaron Holtzes as they uh, presented our scriptures for today. Now, um, when we talked about it earlier this week, I had heard they were gonna dress up and actually act out the parts of each of the characters within the story. So just a little bit disappointed in not seeing that part of it. But I love having the word of God shared with us in that way as we get started. Now, we're in the second week of a sermon series that, that we've called, What's Your Story? And in this series, we're looking at a few of those famous conversion stories in the book of Acts. And this week, of course, as you just heard, we, we come to the conversion story of Saul, who's also known as Paul. And this is quite possibly the, the most famous conversion story in the book of Acts, possibly in all of the Bible or, or even in all of history Right, Because it, it's a fantastic story. It actually reads a little bit like a script from a Hollywood movie, including you know, cool special effects and this horrible villain. There's a group of pacifist rebels that's standing up to this horrific persecution at the hands of this evil empire. And it's got cool secondary characters like Ananias, who in my mind, I see as a kind of gray-haired Obi-Wan Kenobi type figure that uh, helps Saul recover from this terrible injury. And he makes sure that Saul is set on the right path before Ananias himself just kind of fades back into obscurity. So this horrible villain becomes a hero as he joins that rebel cause and he begins to push back against the evil empire. He uses his special God-given gifts to accomplish amazing feats. And he spreads God's message of freedom as, as he becomes a leading proponent of this new way of life. So today... We're gonna look at all the characters and the plot line of the story. And there's a few things that we should specifically look for. If you're taking notes, you'll want to write these down as you see them. Um, as with any Bible study, first, where do you see yourself within the story? You know, like, do you relate to any of the characters that are within it? And then as we identify each of these uh, key moments within the plot line, each of those intersections of God's story with Saul's story and so on, where, where do you see yourself in each one of those situations? And then the next thing that we should look for is what is God revealing to us about himself 
through this story. And then that third thing we should look for is what is God challenging you to go and to do as a result of what you've learned? And today's story starts in the city of Jerusalem. And we see this young man named Saul and he goes to the high priest to receive permission to go to Damascus and arrest followers of this group of people that they call here the way, right? And that's, that's us. These are followers of Christ living the way that Christ lived. So right off the bat, we have this powerful, we have, we have these two powerful members of two key divisions within Judaism coming together for what's basically a, a kind of a, a bipartisan bill. They're gonna work together on this one thing. And, and, and I should warn you before we go much further, I'm gonna list some characters here at the start of this story. And, and some of these characters are gonna be characters that you see and, and, you, and you will, you'll relate to them, but you're not going to want to relate to them, right? But, but thank God that it's, this is a God story. Within God stories, there's always hope, right? There's hope found within this story. And the second thing that you should remember is, as you relate to some of these characters is, is you're not alone in this either, okay? And the, the first of these characters that we come across in this story is Saul. And, and Saul is a Pharisee. And, and it's important to know that Saul's not just any Pharisee. He's a student in a very highly respected school of Pharisees. And in Galatians chapter one, Saul points out that, that he advanced in Judaism beyond many of his peers is what it says. So in this class of standouts, Paul or Saul stood out. Saul, like I said, it was a Pharisee and the Pharisees were a religious sect and the, and the Pharisees were experts in the application of the law and they were very pragmatic. Some of their opponents might even say that they were a little bit liberal in defining how Jews living outside the city of Jerusalem and especially outside the boundaries of Israel could live in accordance with God's law without being able to participate in the system of sacrifices that has been instituted at the temple in Jerusalem. And as part of this though, the, uh, you know, through some creative interpretation of God's law, they, they added quite a few extra rules. And these rules, the Pharisees called the oral traditions of our ancestors. And, and they enforced these rules very strictly. In fact, they made spectacles of the people that weren't able to follow these rules or that didn't live up to them. And by spectacles, I mean, they either put them in prison or they put them to death. All right, the, the Pharisees also, though, made spectacles of themselves when they did follow these rules. Now, the Sadducees, on the other hand, was a small group of powerful elites within the church. The high priest that Saul went to see would have been a member of this party. He would have been a Sadducee. Now, many of the Sadducees were actually connected to members of the Roman government. In fact, many of them received their appointments by the Roman government. And the Sadducees, their beliefs were different from the Pharisees. The, the Sadducees believed that the only true worship of God could be done there at the temple in Jerusalem. In addition to rejecting the oral traditions of their fathers, um, the Sadducees also rejected those teachings of the prophets and other writings within Jewish scripture, which, which we have in our Bible today. And now you might wonder, as we look at this list of three, you know, um, how, are you, how could you or I possibly relate to any of these first three characters or groups of people within this story. Well, first there's Saul, obviously, and, and we're gonna talk about Saul in just a minute. But I wanna focus right now on the Sadducees and the, and the Pharisees, Pharisees first. Because the Pharisees, they were this group of people that thought that their daily and their weekly routines set them apart as special. Some of these practices that they instituted had actually been started by God himself, but they had been done to remind his people that he was involved in every aspect of their life. And, and these laws, these, these rules that God had given, they were being twisted into something of a show, right? In, in hopes that people could prove themselves worthy of being the people of God. And sometimes I see a similar tendency in myself. Sometimes I catch myself thinking, you know, through my actions, that I might be able to reward God or, or impress God into, re into rewarding me. And, and it's completely ridiculous. Sometimes I think through my actions, I might actually be able to drive God away from me. Again, completely ridiculous. But this, this life that we live though, thank God, it, it's a gift of grace. This life that we live as Christ followers is not dependent upon our actions. Instead, God's grace inspires or it actually breathes life into our actions. And then there's this other group, the Sadducees. And the Sadducees kind of picked and chose which scriptures they would follow. 
they, they didn't think that God could or would move with his people outside of the temple and the system of sacrifice and worship that was in place. And where I find myself occasionally relating to this group of people is when I sometimes wanna hold on to like old practices or old ways of doing things. Sometimes I'll look at the way that God moved, you know, a certain number of years ago, and then I'll find myself thinking, you know, what exactly do I have to do? What exactly do I have to put into place to make it happen exactly like that again? And, and neither one of these points of view is healthy. But, but again, thank God for his grace in this. There's hope for us that relate to these first couple of groups of people. In both cases, it's very necessary for us to course correct, right? That's repentance. And it's, and it's necessary for us to prayerfully align ourselves with what God is doing today. We have to remind ourselves that above all, God knows what he's doing. God is the author of this story and not us. Now we see here at the beginning of this, today's story that the bulk of the leaders of Judaism were, were united in wanting to eradicate this new sect that we called in verse two, people that belonged to the way. The reasons are simple. The Sadducees were most likely trying to ensure that the people of Israel uh, stayed quiet they didn't want to bring any attention to themselves. They didn't want to create points of conflict between themselves and the Roman Empire. This was a very uneasy relationship that existed. And the Sadducees didn't want to risk it. But the members of the way, they, they weren't just excited about their Messiah and the one true God. They were actually loud about it. They were telling everybody they came across the good news of this new kingdom that had come to earth and that they were a part of. And then you had the Pharisees. And the Pharisees likely saw this same group, the followers of the way, as dangerous blasphemers, right? They, their strict adherence to the law of the Pharisees did have a higher purpose. See, the Pharisees, they wanted above all to see all the tribes of Israel brought back together as one people, to be in a close relationship with their God. And, and like I said, the Pharisees knew the law inside and out, but they saw strict adherence to that law as the vehicle by which God's promised reconciliation or reunification would come to transpire. And those are the simple reasons that Saul was on that road to Damascus. He was going to prevent his people from encouraging fellow Israelites from chasing after what he considered to be a false prophet and thus prolong this curse that was on the land of Israel that we can read about back in the book of Deuteronomy when the law was actually given to the Israelites. Saul was afraid that these followers of the way were actually driving a wedge further between God's people and the one true God. So we return to our passage today here in Acts 9 and we read this. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And here we see this like miraculous intervention, this great intersection of God's story was Saul's story, right? And right at this intersection sits Jesus. And Jesus, being the, the, the cool rabbi that he is, right? He says, Saul, Saul, he, he leads with a question. Why do you persecute me? And a, a couple of weeks ago, while I was outside pretending to clean my garage, I was uh, listening to a message from a, 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 a long bygone pastor, Charles Spurgeon, uh, who I'm gonna call Chuck from here on out, okay? Um, anyway, he kept repeating this one phrase, why do you persecute me? But he did it several different ways. And he placed a uh, different emphasis uh, or the emphasis on a different word within the question each time that he said it. And by doing that, the question takes on several different meanings. See, first, Chuck said, why do you persecute me? And, and this would have forced Saul to stop and it would have forced him to look at the reasons that he was given or that he was taught for persecuting the followers of the way. Saul's teacher, Gamaliel, was extremely famous and he, he was famous for encouraging his students to memorize the law and not just the law, also all the books of the prophets, all the other writings and the oral traditions of their fathers. So his students were truly the elite within, within Israel when it comes to understanding of the law. And, and Gamaliel would stand in front of his students as they sat at his feet and he would give them questions, kind of legal conundrums, right? And his students would have to back up the reasons for the decisions they would make by quoting the law verse for verse 
back to him. And then they would have to expound on the intent behind the words they were quoting. So Saul might have heard the question asked this way, why do you persecute me? And he might have thought to respond with the legal cause for his actions. And, and then Chuck repeated the question this way, why do you persecute me? Now this is different. This would have forced Saul to stop and examine his personal motivation for persecuting followers of the way. I've already talked about Saul's amazing familiarity with uh, God's law and with all of Hebrew scripture. The problem that Saul had though is this. Saul had all this knowledge of the law, all this history, but he failed to see that it was impossible for his people to live up to those standards that were set by the law. The, the evidence is so plain to see throughout the entire Old Testament. As you read the Old Testament, you see time and time again that the Israelites fell away from following after God, right? And then uh, somebody would stand up, stand in the gap, uh, basically intercede for them, and, and they would come back. But they continued to fail to live up to those rigorous, that, that onerous set of laws that was set up. And, and Saul was so focused on the law and those rituals of everyday life that he was completely missing the point. He was missing the fact that as badly as Saul wanted the Israelites to be restored as God's chosen people, that was nothing compared to how focused God was on having a close relationship with all people. Saul was willing to go to any length, and that includes the death of fellow Jews, to ensure that the Jewish people stuck to what he saw as the right path. But God was willing to go to any length, including the death of his own son, to ensure that reunification with all of humanity would happen on God's terms. Once again, it's extremely important that we remember that this is God's story. God is writing this story, not us. Saul couldn't see the big picture because he was so focused on those minute details. Saul was so close. He was pursuing God. He was doing it with all of his heart, right? But, but here's the thing. He was off target. And by being just the tiniest bit off target, it led to the needless deaths of many of his fellow Jews. Some of those were put to death actually on the command or, or via the vote of Saul himself. And here's a really hard truth. If by our own misguided actions, we do things in God's name and we do them without considering God's true plan, it might be true that here on earth, we aren't killing people in the here and now. But if we turn people off, if we prevent them from coming to know him by being just a little bit off target, we could very well be held accountable for their eternal lives. Now, Spurgeon again, he, he, he asks this question and he does it this time with a different emphasis. He says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And this time, or in this way, Saul would have been forced to stop and he would have had to look at his actions, right? He would have had to look and think, was the course of action the correct one? Was it truly justified by the situation in front of him? If Saul hadn't been spiritually blind to the awesome move of God that was happening all around him, if he would have just assembled the facts that were right in front of his face, he would have recognized that the right course of action when confronted with Jesus Christ as Messiah was not to persecute, but instead to stop and to declare him Lord, to worship him. And then finally, Chuck said it this way. He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And this time, Saul would have had to stop and examine the true target of his actions. And what's interesting in Saul's case is that, that he thought he was persecuting a group of blasphemous Jews. He thought they were preventing God from returning to live with his people. But this voice, and when it's said this way, makes it sound personal, like he was hurting one person in particular. In fact, at this, Saul himself had to speak up and he had to ask his own question. And he said, who are you, Lord? And the voice identifies itself and it says simply, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. And this one statement is, it's truly profound for us as the contemporary or this current iteration of members of the way, right? In this simple response, Jesus tells Saul that the group he was persecuting were truly one and the same as Jesus Christ. 
We truly are Christ's body. We share his blood, we share his DNA. Uh, we, we more than represent him through the Holy Spirit. He lives within us and together as his body, we are Christ in this current age. So here we are at this intersection of God's story and Saul's and we're introduced to the true hero of the story and that's Jesus. And when Jesus revealed himself to Saul, Jesus completely wrecked Saul's world. Saul was hunting down people that claimed that Jesus was the Messiah. And here was that very same Jesus revealing himself to Saul as the true resurrected Messiah. He was doing this right in the middle of Saul's sin. And he was asking Saul, this brilliant lawyer, to cross-examine himself and his actions. And that's the intersection that, you know, many of us have found ourselves in at some point in our lives, right? Uh, Examining our beliefs, examining our motivations, and examining our actions. And thankfully, prayerfully, that's where we meet Jesus. At this point in the story, we see that Saul, as a reminder of his spiritual blindness, was struck physically blind. And here we're introduced to some of these characters in the story that it might actually be a little bit easy to overlook. And that's Saul's companions. That's that's this, the men that were with him that day. And, and it says in, this, in these chapters, that, or in this passage, that they led him to the house of a man named Judas who lived on Straight Street in Damascus. Verse seven says that these men heard the voice that Saul heard, but they didn't see anyone. And then in Acts chapter 22, verse 10, Saul is telling the story to the Israelites and, and, or to the Jewish people in Jerusalem. And he, and he says that the men that were with him heard the voice, but they couldn't distinguish what it was saying. I believe the call of God is often very specific. Sorry, just a second. What? Okay. I thought they were trying to get my attention. Was that like some cool intersection of God's story with our story that I just missed? (laughs) All right. (laughs) Sorry, I was trying to be respectful. I thought I saw something that I needed to address there. All right. So, Back to our story, okay? Uh, Saul's companions, the men that were with him that day. Well, here's the thing. They were with Saul. They saw the light, but, but they didn't see Jesus. They were with Saul. They heard a voice, but they couldn't dis- discern what it was saying. And sometimes that call of Jesus on us is like that. It's often very specific. And see, you might be sitting here today in this room with a few hundred of your closest friends, like Angelo, and Carrie, and some of the others. Hi. <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, this story might go right past you. It might go in one ear and out the other, but the person next to you might hear something that touches their life. Maybe it's, it hits a soft spot, and they don't know what step to take next. Well, you just might have a vital role in their story. They may need you to take them by the hand and lead them to the next step on their journey, and you need to be ready for that. Now, The next person we come to is Ananias. And it says that God appears to Ananias in a dream. And he's this man of Damascus, right? And Ananias, we have to remember, is kind of a common name in the book of Acts. There's at least three of them. One of them is the Ananias that talked to Peter back earlier in the book. And uh, he was struck dead for lying, right? And then later there's another Ananias that's a high priest that has Paul or Saul illegally slapped Again, a different Ananias. This Ananias is the good one. He's like right in the middle. And this is a cool Ananias, all right? Now, a few things stand out to me in this part of the story, though. First, in verse 10, Ananias immediately recognized God's voice. And and we read in other passages where people are sometimes confused by the presence of God. Sometimes they deem themselves unworthy or they fall to their face, right? But, but Ananias seems to have been pretty calm right here. It's almost like Ananias had a close personal relationship with God. And then the second thing I notice is that Ananias knows who Saul is and, and he knows exactly why he had come to Damascus. In fact, the third thing we see is that Ananias was afraid but Ananias was not afraid to speak up. He reminds God, uh, you know, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he's done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he's come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. 
And right here, I think it's really easy to relate to Ananias in this moment of hesitation. We can be scared of what other people might do, what they might say to us, or even just what they might think about us when we share God's love with them, when we share God's story. But the fourth thing is where we see God in this. As he responds to Ananias, God is patient with him, but he's also persistent. And it says, the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. And then immediately after hearing this command from the Lord, we see Ananias' response. And this is in verses 17 through 19. And the obvious big thing we see here is that Saul's sight is miraculously restored. But there's a couple other kind of key details that it's really important that we don't miss. First is this, Ananias went to the house and he entered it. And we might be tempted to think on our own, God, I'll be a witness for you, but I'd be much more comfortable if it was on my own turf. But the truth is, we've got to follow the examples of the men that we've seen in these stories the past couple of weeks. We've got to go. We've got to meet people that, know, that, that don't know Jesus as Lord where they are. And that includes where they live, where they work, and where they play. And we have to remember that we carry Christ within us. We take him with us when we go into the city, into our workplaces, and into our homes and the homes of our neighbors. And that's exactly what Ananias did. He went right into the home where Saul was. Saul was this known, evil, and terrible sinner. And in verse 17, it says that Ananias placed his hands on Saul, and then the first word out of his mouth was brother. And then he prayed, and Saul's vision was restored. And when we carry Christ into the city, when we carry him into our homes and into our neighborhoods, when we truly engage with the lives of the people around us, people's eyes will be opened. They will respond to the love that we share, especially when we share that love in tangible ways. And that's why we have events like Love Our City. It's, it's a way for us to go and tangibly express Christ's love to the people in our city. It's, it's a way for you to take the unique gifts that you've been given. And sometimes we think of gifts as things like um, certain abilities or, or things. Gifts can be so simple. Some, somebody might just need a rake or a lawnmower. That might be the gift that you've been given to go and share with somebody in love. You know, or it could be that you need to go and actually mow somebody's lawn or rake their yard. You know, expressing Christ's love in tangible ways. Love Our City is a very simple way for us to do that. And that's one of the reasons we do that. Now, Ananias did this. He, he actually went in and laid his hands on Saul. Sharing that brotherly hug is just one way to tangibly show the love of God. I love how Saul recounts this story, actually, in Acts chapter 22. He said that immediately after receiving his sight, Ananias says this to him. He says, the God of our ancestors has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You'll be his witness to all people of what you've seen and heard. And now, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. And the part of that that I love is when Ananias says, what are you waiting for? Ananias speaks with such boldness and such clarity as he prompts or urges Saul to take the next step in his faith journey. Now, Friday, I was studying for this message and I was sitting in my office and Matthew Philip came in. And Matthew Philip is our leader of global engagement. And Matthew is known at times to say like some really cool and wise things. Uh, not, not all the time, but sometimes he says some really cool and wise things. And he said, Andy, in this story, I see a lot of movement. It seems to me that transformation happens in the movement. As we listen to God and take steps to move in accordance with his will, we are transformed. Ananias listened to God. He took immediate action and had faith that God would do the rest. Saul's life was transformed as Ananias was at this vital intersection of God's story with Saul's story. And if you don't relate to Ananias, Maybe there's someone in your story that when you think back that, that you can relate to Ananias, that has been Ananias in your life, that showed up at that intersection of God's story with yours. What an awesome example that is of living and loving like Jesus. See, we're, we're God with skin on to the people around us, right? We're at the intersection of their life with God's story. Sometimes we're like Saul's companions. Sometimes we just need to step in take someone by the hand and lead them to the next step in their journey. Other times we might be more like Ananias 
And we might need to take a little more active role, tangibly showing the love of God and encouraging, even prodding people to take that next step in their faith journey. Now we come to the final character in today's story, and this is Saul again, but this is Saul post-conversion. Following his baptism, we see, as, as we read on, if we were to read on in Acts and, and then Saul's letters, Saul launched his career as a missionary. And, and as I just said, he, he wrote several letters to the church that are in our Bible today. And, and through these letters, he lays this foundational kind of theological groundwork that demonstrates how Jesus is truly the fulfillment of the promise that God gave to his people. Saul's perspective has been completely changed. Now, if, if we look at Saul as this great theologian, it, it might be kind of hard for us to relate to him. But when we think of him as a man that started off just living life, and, and it's living a life that he thought of as good, but, but, but he was off target and in need of a course correction. When we think of him as someone that thought he could prove himself worthy of God by his actions before he was finally confronted with the truth of Jesus Christ as Messiah and Lord, uh, when we look at him that way, it becomes easier for us to relate to him. We can see his story then, not as just like this kind of wild and crazy outlier, but instead it's something that not only we can understand, but that we can relate to. And, and we've got to remember, this intersection of Saul's story with God's story, it wasn't the first intersection, and, and it wasn't anywhere near the last. Prior to this, you see Saul's name pop up a couple times in the book of Acts. Honestly, it, it's not in a great light. <laughs> Saul was not a good guy. But as you read Saul's letters in the New Testament, you'll see call, Saul say that he was called at birth or, or in his mother's womb. And, and then at an early age, he was uniquely gifted. He was uniquely called by God. He was actually the perfect person for the ministry God would later you know, fully call him into. From the Damascus Road forward, God's story intersected with Saul's. And we see that more and more frequently until by the time you read through the rest of the book of Acts and Saul's letters, you see God's story and Saul's story intersect so closely that they actually become intertwined to the point where they become almost indistinguishable one from the other. And, and we should be inspired by this. We should be inspired by Saul. We should be inspired by his companions. And we should be inspired by Ananias. And the, what we should do with this is, is look at our own stories, examine our own lives, and look for those intersections of God's story with ours. And then we need to listen, we need to receive God's instructions, and then we need to move, using our unique gifts to live out God's calling. Remember, living and loving like Jesus is, is not just being with God and being with others. It, it is also being sent. None of those three things is exclusive of the others. Being formed and being sent, those aren't two separate things. We are formed and we are sent and we are transformed in the sending. Our stories become so closely intertwined with God's that they become indistinguishable. Now, personally, when I look at my own story and I recount those intersections of God's story and my story, I can kind of see some of those intersections in this way. First, I was, uh, I was born. I was God's gift to my parents, right? So there's the first intersection. But then around seven and a half or so, I started thinking about God as a, as a pretty cool alternative to hell. But then I attended a vacation Bible study and there was a lady that was kind of an Ananias in my life. Her name was Mary Daughtery. And she showed me how much God loved me. And I can remember, we, we studied Psalms 119 that summer. And, and it's, a, it's, a, it, it's a Psalm really about God's word. But there's a verse in there that still stands out to me today. Uh, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. And, and Mary used this verse to break down for me really how much God loved me too. And, and, and what a gift his word was to us as well. But Mary was one of those first Ananiases in my life. She, she loved on us kids in that small, it's a little Southern Baptist church in Taylorville, Illinois. Uh, by the end of November, I was convinced. I, I went forward in that church and gave my life to Christ. I remember I, I had a Christmas tree ornament in my hand. They'd, they'd given them out that day. It was a little wooden train. But, but here's the thing. At that point, I honestly thought that that was the last intersection that I was gonna have of God with my life until the day I died. And then, and then when I died, I would be with God in heaven. And that was the next intersection. But that's not how this works at all. And in my own life, Another intersection came just a couple years later. Uh, I can remember my parents going to a conference in another city. And then they came home and one of my sisters was sick. 
And I can remember us in that room, they had my sister sit on a stool and they laid hands on her and they prayed for her. And I thought, God works beyond salvation in our lives. You know, this is the first that I saw real evidence of this was as my parents laying hands on my sister and praying for a healing. And then a few years later, um, we, we, we had moved to St. Louis and we went to a church in St. Louis and in this church in St. Louis, they, they talked very regularly about how God, through the person of his Holy Spirit, lives in us and works through us and he impacts not just our lives but the lives of the people around us. So here I'm seeing these other intersections that there's other places where God's story intersects with ours. Uh, later, I, I joined the army, I, I went away. I, I actually walked away from God at that point too, quite a bit. But, but here's the thing, even in that time, just these really weird instances kept coming up that I see now in retrospect as I look at my story where uh, my story and God's story intersected. A weird one was when we had to get, when we got our dog tags, I remember they, had, they asked us what religion we were. And I said, Christian, and, and I, I felt a little guilty, but, but, I, but I said it. And, and then um, later, I'd, I was overseas, I was in Korea, I was serving in Seoul, and um, I remember being in Itaewon, just hanging out, up to no good. And a couple people came up to me, they saw a cross that I had on around my neck, and they said, hey, I see you're wearing a cross, are you a Christian? So again, I had these little intersections. Again, a little bit of guilt in that one, you know, because I really wasn't living as I should. A year later, though, I was overseas, I was in a war with, uh, it, it was the original Gulf War, or not the original, but the Gulf War, sorry. Um, and, in, and at that time, there was this kid, Shane, that just pestered me about Christ over and over. I, I, I didn't like it. But again, intersection after intersection with my story and Christ's story. And then I received this major, there was, there was a major intersection while I was overseas. It was a letter I received from my best friend's mom that described all of the ways that I had left God, but how much the love that he had for me outweighed all of those sins. It, it was an amazing letter, but it was this major intersection of my life with God's life, my story with God's story. And it made me at that point, finally, I thought, I, these, these intersections are coming up so regularly that, that I, can't, I couldn't do anything but acknowledge that God's story and mine were actually two stories that were meant to be intertwined. Over the course of the years that have followed, there's been times when I've felt the weaving of that fabric of our stories uh, becoming loose. Every time though, it was my own actions, not, not God's that, that pulled that apart. And, but, but I turned to God and he wove that back together. And, and I look forward to someday those stories just being completely indistinguishable one from another. I look forward to taking those unique gifts that I know that God has given me. I'm a computer geek, I'm a technology nerd, I'm an avid reader. Right, these are some gifts that God has given me. And I look forward to applying those gifts in my everyday work. And I, look for, and I look forward to opportunities like today where I get to share my story as an example to you of how you can look back and see God at work in your own story. And hopefully also as an inspiration for you to share your story and to share the love of God in tangible ways with the people that are around you. See, you, you as a Christ carrier, are at the intersection of God's story and the life stories of the people you come in contact with every day. And it comes down to this, are you listening to God? Are you ready to step in with whatever help is needed to urge them or to help them take that next step in their relationship with him? Now, when we come together as the body of Christ each week, we do it to worship God, we do it to encourage one another, and we, and we do it to be equipped to go and to do the work of ministry throughout the rest of the week. And these services, actually, they sit at an interesting intersection in that. And, and it's this intersection. It's the intersection of last week and next. And, and in these services, there's this aspect of recovery, reflection, sometimes mourning, and, and sometimes celebration for what's taken place in the last seven days. And then there's also this idea that we're being launched into the next seven. So it's important that we take a few moments each week and, and we stop and we consider what Christ has done and what he's doing in our lives. So today, during this time in which we are about to take the Lord's Supper, I'd like to ask you to consider a couple things, 
all right? I like to ask you to think about this past week. Where have you seen God's story intersect with yours? What things over the past seven days would you like to celebrate? And then where do you see places that you wish you had done things differently? Where might you need to course correct? Think on those things too. Give a prayer of thanksgiving and then a prayer of repentance for those places where you might've missed the mark. Remember, there's therefore now no condemnation for those of us that are in Christ Jesus. I think it's important that we remember that. But then, as you take the bread that represents Christ's body, think about how Christ gives you strength to do both things, to be thankful in all things, and also to walk through those periods of pain and regret that are in our lives. And and he also gives us the strength that we need to course correct. And then consider, as you look at that bread, how we are all together part of that same body, that we lend to each other that strength as well to do those things. We can take one another by the hand as Christ, as members of Christ's body and we can lead each other to the next step in our faith journey. And then as you drink that juice that represents Christ's blood, think about this. Think about how that blood has washed away your sins, those times that you have missed the mark, those times you've been off target. And again, say that prayer of thanksgiving. Now, if you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, If you have yet to make him Lord of your life, please, uh, during this time of communion, think about the love of Jesus that you've heard about today. And I so badly want to say to you those same words that Ananias said, what are you waiting for, right? But but here's the thing. Lean into today. Lean into this intersection of God's story with your story. Contemplate what your next step is. If you have a question about your next step, please, after the service, Come down, there'll be a few of us down here uh, ready to pray with you. And now, right after I pray here in just a second, uh, everyone that's participating in the Lord's Supper, please go to one of these tables around the room that are set up with, and they have the elements of the Lord's Supper there. And please collect the elements and then return to your seats. Be sure as you do this, remember we're doing this collectively as Christ's family, as his body. Be sure to offer your strength to the people you see along the way. Just smile, acknowledge them, say hi. If you don't have it in you to to smile today, please be encouraged by the smiles of the people you see on your way to and from the tables. And then after you've, you've returned to your seat, after you've prayed and taken the elements, at that point, please join us in a song when you're ready, okay? And then after the song, John Heflick, our, lead, our local engagement lead, is gonna come up and share some next steps for us. And he's gonna launch us into the missions field for this following week, right? Uh, Right now, let's pray, and then we'll take the Lord's Supper together. Father God, thank you. God, thank you, first of all, for the gift of your son, Jesus Christ, the true hero in all of our stories, God. Thank you for all of the gifts that you've placed in the lives of the people within this church family, God. God, I pray that uh, open our eyes to the ways, uh, not just that, that, that you have loved us, but to the ways that we can love those around us as well. God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you help us to be that companion, that Ananias and the lives of those around us and the lives of the people in our city and the lives of the people in our workplaces, God, in our homes as well. And Father God, as we here now contemplate the gift of your son to us, his body and his blood, God, please know that I pray all of these things in the name of your son, Jesus. Amen.
Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you.
hello, my name is John and I'm the local outreach lead here at Crossroads. This coming Saturday, we have an opportunity to go out and serve with our nonprofit partners in our community to do practical good for our neighbors in our neighborhoods. And just like Andy was saying, it is an opportunity for our story to weave with some other people's stories in God's omnipotence in parts of our city and with people that we may not ever go to. Now there are cards on the tables back there with a QR code that lists the projects that we're gonna be participating in and you can scan the QR code to register. You know, it, this week I was thinking about uh, a, a conversation that I had with a potential volunteer and you know, I get the privilege of doing that quite a bit. And really sweet lady, she had come and uh, just said, hey, I, I was, uh, have been serving in the church for a long time and will continue to do so in children's ministry. We always love that. And she said, but I've got a little bit more oppor opportunity to maybe time on my hands lately and was just wondering what God was doing in our community and how I might plug into that. And we talked about a couple options and opportunities. because She said, I, I just feel like there might be something in addition to serving within the church out there for me. And that was a great question to ask, right? And it kind of propped up in my mind uh, an analogy, and maybe this makes sense and maybe it doesn't, but uh, it, it's kind of like every week the, a lot of us come to church and we're in a car. We use cars to come here, right? Uh, and when we get to church, you know, we, our car is on. We love Jesus and we worship and we stand up and we, we raise our hands. And so the car is on and, and, and you might even press the pedal a little bit to rev the engine. And we listen to God and we want to, we want to do what he says and so we, we move the steering wheel. And each week we kind of come and do that. And some of us are sitting here going, well, I wonder why then I don't feel like I'm moving forward. Because I'm coming to church and I'm revving the engine and I'm turning the steering wheel. But for some of us in this room, just simply putting that thing from park into drive might be the difference between us feeling like we're kind of coming and doing the same thing each week and actually making progress and forward motion in our spiritual lives. So I wanna invite you to join God's mission in our community. There's a whole bunch of things to do and it's not all that scary stuff, it's just a couple hours. So come alongside a bunch of other people from Crossroads and in our community and, and let's serve God together this coming Saturday. Now, serving God together means that we go and join our nonprofit partners in our community and we love what they, do every day of the week and serving God in neighbors uh, for neighborhoods and in neighbors uh, that we don't necessarily get to touch each, each day. And so generosity at Crossroads becomes this collective opportunity, right? To join forces with all of us to do a little bit more practical good with our nonprofit partners than we may be able to do ourselves. And so every week we collect an offering. There's some boxes back there if you want to old school write a check or there's some ways to give up here on the screen as well. But this allows us to collectively do more good than we would be able to do individually. Now, if you're here today and you kind of came in feeling a little scraggly, and that's okay. There are days that I come in feeling that way too. Uh, and you just want someone to pray with you and to support you. We want to be here. We want to be a church family that lifts each other up. Uh, there'll be some people down front here to offer some prayer with you, to listen to what's going on in your life, and uh, because we really do want to be a church family that supports each other and lifts each other up to the God who really can make change. And if you're new here and uh, kicking the tires on crossroads or maybe even kicking the tires on Jesus, that's cool. We love that you're here. Um, please make sure that you uh, connect with someone at the Welcome Center out there. We've got some information for you and would love to continue to connect with you. So finally, let's think about when we're leaving this place, we're leaving a time where we've been here, heard from God, and we felt God's presence here. But that doesn't mean that God's not out there too, right? So let's go in God's presence all this week and his peace. Have a good week.